Welcome to the Turner College Executive Speaker Series, last one for the for this semester. We're really, really privileged today to have Ms. Julia Davis here from uh, AFLAC, Senior Vice President and uh, Chief Information Officer of AFLAC. She's been there for about three years, almost. Yep, a little over three. Uh, comes to us from uh, long, lengthy experiences in IT at American Safety Insurance, uh, GE, uh, a couple different organizations in GE. Very, very well recognized in the industry. She was um, recently selected as one of Computer World's premier 100 technology leaders for 2016, which is probably a pinnacle of, of, of most people's uh, careers. That's, that's very, very impressive. Uh, she began her career in the, in the Air Force as a software engineer, earned the rank of captain. Uh, she uh, received her Bachelor of Science in Engineering Physics from Lehigh University and her ma Master's in Systems Administration from St. Mary's. Mm -hmm. uh, join me in, in a warm, warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you all. Well, I, you know, one of the slides I wanted to start with is give you a little background on how I got to where I am uh, before I start talking a little bit about why ethics and leadership is very important in any organization. So a little bit about the background. This is a picture of me that everybody thought was cute because nobody would recognize me of getting my start. And this was me at six years old. And at six, I got to watch Neil Armstrong walk on the moon. And I told my dad, I want to be an astronaut. This is something I want to do. I, I like science and math. I, this, is, this is what I want to be. Now, at that age, in the 60s, not many parents would say, OK, you're a girl. You can be an astronaut. I think the standard response was, boys. Only boys can be astronauts. You can be a princess. Yeah, right. <laughs> that wasn't me. That wasn't something I was interested in. So I studied a lot in school. I worked really hard. And at 16, I decided, you know what? I think I need to learn to fly a plane. I think that'll help me get into um, the space program. I'll go into the Air Force. It'll give me an opportunity to uh, set my bar pretty high. Well, again, going to my dad and asking him, hey, can I learn to fly a plane? You would think most fathers would not want that to be an activity for their daughters to take on. Uh, especially since I lived in New Jersey and you can't actually drive a car until you're 17. So here I was asking to learn to fly a plane before I could learn to drive a car. But again, I got his support in saying I can be anything and do anything that I want to do. So with that, I, I took my flying lessons. I, I learned to fly a plane long before I learned to drive a car and uh, loved that opportunity. Unfortunately, I started to have my eyesight go awry. And as you can see, I have these very thick glasses on now. And that wasn't something that lended itself to being a pilot, certainly not in the Air Force. But I did go into the Air Force. I got an ROTC scholarship that covered my education at Lehigh University. And I studied engineering physics. Because at that time, we didn't have anything called computer science or computer engineering. That was considered fad engineering. <laughs> and you had to learn the basics. So I thought, well, it, you know, physics background is going to give me an opportunity to learn any aspect of engineering, whatever I may decide to go into. But I think it'll help me get into NASA. So I graduated from college, deciding that, OK, let's go and uh, see what I'm, is holding out for me. I put in, posted for two positions, one in Florida, one in Texas for NASA. But at that time, the Air Force was beginning to recognize they needed people that understood computers and understood uh, the, the new way of technology and where it was going. I didn't get into NASA. Instead, they said, you're going to be a software engineer and do programming for uh, manpower management, which is a great way to say, OK, I'm going to do uh, logistics modeling. How exciting is that? Do programming, but I'm not going to NASA. But I did get Texas. So I wound up going to Texas and um, became a software engineer and started learning about programming and learning about how to use um, radar range equations and, and apply that to plotting radar uh, traps for pilots and how they can fly through the different geographic terrains. We were doing precursors to what you see is now Google Earth, uh, but this was something we were doing in the 80s in the Air Force. So it was a lot of fun stuff, a lot of great high-tech stuff, gave me an opportunity to, to really explore that area and that career field. Who knew from a physics degree that's where I'd wind up. But the time came in the Air Force where I had to make a decision about what path was I going to choose? What way was I going to go? Was I going to stay career military, which meant I had to leave 
technology. It meant I had to take jobs that would be more like what the military was looking for. Or do I get out and go start in the tech industry? Well, I made the decision to leave and go into the tech industry. And I had a long career path working my way up through a variety of technical jobs from programmer to analyst to project manager to program manager to a CIO. Uh, a, long, a long route. I did software sales at one point, a lot of different things. All aspects of technology for a variety of different companies and organizations. And along the way I found there are things that I liked about co some companies and things I didn't like. And I learned through some hard lessons as well as some good lessons about what it means to be ethical and be an ethical leader. And some of the things that I learned in the military I still apply to this day. You can't force people up a hill. You have to make them want to follow you up the hill. And that is one of the most valuable lessons I've learned is it's not about pushing people to do things. It's about getting them to come along and be part of that journey. The leadership lessons I learned in the military carry through with me to this day. But there are also lessons I learned throughout my, my life, not only in school, in studying, and some of the things that I did. I took every opportunity and advantage to apply that to what I was doing in the workplace. But the biggest difference I found in what made me happy in my job and made me enjoy what I was doing and coming to work was the ethics that my company practiced. And that's why it's become very important for me to be able to have this discussion with people as you start out in your career about the value of ethical leadership. And I just want to kind of give you a little overview of the definition of ethical leadership. It's directed by respect for ethical beliefs and values and for the dignity and rights of others. And trust me, there are a lot of companies out there that I've experienced that don't practice this. They say they do, but they don't. And it's become very important, especially at AFLAC. For us, we've learned from what other companies didn't do. And too often we see this in the press. We see examples of companies that didn't follow the values that they preached. Look at Wells Fargo. What happened at Wells Fargo? They were incented to open accounts on behalf of their customers without their customers' permission. They had over two million dollars, two million, I'm sorry, uh, two million unauthorized accounts were opened. This was just to hit sales targets. They didn't ask people. They opened up credit cards. They opened up checking accounts, whatever it took to pad their wallet and make the company's numbers inflated. When it was all said and done, though, 5,300 employees were terminated for this. A lot of leadership didn't know about it, but they might also have been looking the other way. But they certainly got their bonuses based on it even though there were fines of 185 million. And look at the reputation hit. 13% stock loss. That's not just because of the fines, it's because of the reputation. That's what we're facing. Unethical leadership leads to loss in value of your stock. How many of us remember Bernie Madoff? Yeah. <laughs> Bernie Madoff, I don't know if you guys had an opportunity to watch the movie that was done on TV that Richard Dreyfuss did, but I had no idea. I got a chance to watch that movie, and I got to tell you, I had, I, I mean, I knew about some of the Ponzi scheme and what he had done, but I had no idea the depth of what he went through. The people he built, $18 billion. All these people that lost, 16,000 claims filed. But can imagine how many more weren't filed. All these people he built, all in the interest of taking that money, skimming it off the top, he never invested a penny. Not one penny of the money. And no one bothered to check up on him. Because this guy had a reputation that said he was above board, he was president of NASDAQ for three years, had a fantastic story, very convincing individual. But you watch the movie and you realize the level, the depth to which his ethics, he cared nothing for these people that he built, including his own assistant, his own secretary. Horrible story. That wasn't a good lesson for him because his, his children left him, his wife left him, and he's in prison for the rest of his life. But this is not something you want to learn from. This is something that, you know, the takeaway from this is it eventually catches up with you. Very few people get away with it. 
another example, Toshiba. And th there's so many cases after cases. These are just some of the more the recent ones that come to mind. Toshiba basically had a boatload of projects going on, and they were costing the company millions and billions of dollars. But they they underestimated the cost. They didn't put the full cost in, so they were overstating their profits by $1.9 billion. Basically, what they realized is when they had to report their losses, for, it turned out to be a $4.4 billion net loss, mainly because of stock drops, and half of the board of directors resigned because they were aware of this. And imagine what it does. Again, this is all reputation. And it's hard to recover. Volkswagen's another one. Can you imagine what people were, what were they thinking? Let's fudge, let's, how much time and money did they spend working on the software so that they could show that the emissions weren't quite what they were supposed to be <laughs> and not think that they're going to get caught? Well, they got caught and look what it did to their stock. One of many. So what I find interesting is Deloitte did a study on millennials. And I find this interesting because I'm a baby boomer. And, you know, I think most of the millennials probably think but us baby boomers, all we care about is the dollar. And that might have been true uh, earlier on in my career, but the more I got exposed to the CD side of business, the less I liked it, the less I wanted to be involved with it, the more I started making that important for me to look at the company and its values and its ethics. And what's interesting is in this study, if you look at the 15 study against the 16 study, actually people thought things are getting better in corporate America. Maybe it's because so much more is getting exposed and there are repercussions from all these actions of ethics and ethical behavior that they're realizing that corporates, corporations need to now pay more attention to this. So all the indicators are there, but the bottom line is there's still a large perception that companies are in it for the, the good of the company, not necessarily the good of their customers or the good of their employees. This is another part of the survey they did. And what was interesting to me is they actually, the, the people that were respondents, uh, was over 7,000 folks born after 1982 in 29 different countries that had jobs and were working for a large company, over 100 employees. And the number one thing that people looked for in the job was a good work-life balance over the opportunity for promotion. And that's going to play into some of the things that I'm going to discuss with you next is about values and, and in a corporation and how you can walk the talk. But what that means for having a good work-life balance. You see other things up there about the sense of meaning from work, impact on society, strong sense of purpose. A lot more factors weighted on that when people are making decisions about where they want to go. And we as a company at Aflac recognize this. We know this is important and it certainly as we go through the recruiting process and we're looking to bring on more millennials into the workforce because the work it tells us by the year 2025 the majority of our workforce will be millennials. We have to be able to address this and all corporations have to be able to address this and recognize this is an important factor in how you run your company. So AFLAC, what makes AFLAC different? And the reason why I came to AFLAC is one of the things that I did my research on is I looked at the company and I wanted to make sure they walked the talk. I heard about the AFLAC way, I heard about their ethics, and Ethisphere is a company that does an assessment on an annual basis and looks at a variety of factors about a company's involvement in their community, in, in helping society in general, uh, feedback about the company and the brand. And Aflac is the only insurance company that's received this award for 10 consecutive years. It's a, it's a huge difference. That truly, this is a validation that Aflac walks the talk. And when I came to interview at Aflac, I was blown away blown away by the passion for the brand, the, the, the passion people felt for their employees. I had never seen anything like it. I couldn't begin to understand that because most companies I worked for, you know, that was something they talked about and they, they might have done stuff, um, but it didn't seem like it was part of the DNA. It just didn't seem embedded with them. And that made all the difference for me and why I wanted to come there, is they really believed what they were, they were talking about. And these seven values were the AFLAC way values. 
And these are things that made a difference in when I was talking with folks and understanding how do they apply, how do they work. This communicate regularly. regularly. One of the things that, you know, so often you get caught in a vacuum and you don't really communicate with your customers, you don't really communicate with your employees. This was huge for Aflac. And one of the things I found when I got there is the IT organization wasn't very good about communicating with their customers. We had a 40% customer satisfaction score. And that's our internal customers. So that's other people in the business. It's the people we write programs for. It's the people that we um, develop systems for. It's the people whose PCs we repair. It's the network that we run for folks in the company. They thought of us as this isolated, out in a building by ourselves, never talking to anyone. And one of the things that we had to do was implement a program of creating a program manager for our customers so that they could sit there with their customers, find out what their pain points, help them understand what our pain points were because we don't have unlimited resources. We can't program everything they ask us to do. If we did, I'd have to quadruple my team. <laughs> I'm not gonna get that kind of money. So we have to set realistic expectations. That's what those program managers did, is they got out there, they listened to their customers, and they acted on it, and they helped them set priorities and determine what they needed to do. This isn't a natural skill set for IT people. Communication is not one of the things we do well. But I had to find those people, and they exist. They're out there. Leverage them and put them in the right positions, and they did a fantastic job for us so that our last customer sat score, we went from 40 to 79. 39 point jump in three years. All by changing how we talk to people. Respond immediately is another area that I think a lot of people so often they kind of sit back and they don't necessarily say, you know, if somebody asks a question or a crisis happens, let's, see, let's wait and see what happens. Well, I think of all those experiences, you know, we've seen with data breaches. Look at what happened at Target. They didn't say anything. They knew about the breach. They sat on it. It came out. They didn't respond. They didn't react. The press speculated, and the next thing you know, their, their stock is dropping like crazy. Home Depot had the exact same thing happen about a month or two later, but they were in the press, they were talking about it, they were proactive, they said, this is what we're gonna do, and they did it. Made all the difference in the world. Their stock didn't tank, like Target's did. Respond immediately is a very important value. You can't just wish things to go away and hope they happen. Know your stuff. This is a very important one. Sometimes you are the expert, you can provide the expert guidance, but the reality is not every time are you gonna know everything. And when you don't, know the difference. Know how to find someone that can get the answer. Know how to seek out someone who can help you do it. It's not just about you being the expert, it's about you finding the answer. That's really what this one's about. Don't pretend like you know. A lot of people do. And then the situation just gets worse. Projects spiral out of control. They take too long. People are afraid to raise the red flag. They're afraid to ask for help. Well, part of knowing your stuff is knowing when to ask for help. Treat everyone with respect and care. You can't get any more basic than that. People want to work for people that they know care about them. You don't want to work for the guy that's going to be order, barking orders at you every day and telling you what to do and micromanaging your job. You've got to be able to, to respond accordingly. And if you treat your employees with respect, they're going to treat their customers with respect. Your problem is my problem. I can't tell you the number of times I get emails from field agents or from customers who are irate or upset about something. Well, I could pass the buck. I could send the email on to somebody else. But I make sure they get an answer. I respond personally. They've made this my problem, it's my responsibility to fix it, not pass the buck. That's an important tenet of what we do at Aflac. Shoot straight is another one. That means say what you think, back it with opinions, but don't try and, and sugarcoat stuff. Our, our leader has an expression um, that I love, Dan Amos constantly will say this, and you'll see this throughout the presentation, is bad news doesn't get better with age. And it really doesn't. Better to say what, what your concern is, your issue, raise the red flag early, then people will help you and you'll be able to resolve it. And cover your customer, not your behind. <laughs> the not your behind is implied behind that, but 
we get promoted at Affleck based on what we do for our customers, not based on what we do for our careers. So I'm going to dig a little bit more into some of these because I want to keep reiterating that theme of these seven values. And these are Afflecs, they're specific to Aflac, but I have to tell you when I was in the military, we had many of these same values instilled in us. They're things that I carry through to the, this day and make sure it's part of your mantra, and make sure it's part of what you believe in. Because it made a difference for me when I'm in a company and I realize they're not practicing these values. I begin to realize maybe that wasn't the company for me and it was time to move on. Because these are pretty core and pretty essential. And I think they summarize my experience and, and my job opportunities and what's worked for me and what hasn't. So communicate regularly. I have to tell you, you know, I, I talked a little bit about that program manager role and what it did for us. And it's more about being able to have that relationship with your customers. Again, IT people, not so good about it. But I can tell you it will make all the difference in the world if you actively take a team, you work together, everybody has strengths and weaknesses, the goal is play to your strengths, and make sure you're talking to each other. You can't just do it in a text. I can tell you, you can't just do it in, in an email, you can't do it in an instant message. There are nuances there and they don't get uncovered with emojis. They don't. You have to have conversation, and, and I, I think that that's a challenge for a lot of folks in this day and age. It's faster to, to write something down in a, a text and send it than it is to pick up the phone and call. But 39% customer sat, that's how, because that's how we responded to our customers, versus conversation, and it's 79%. Big difference. I'll take that as a lesson learned. Respond immediately. I'm sure some of you remember the tsunami that hit Japan in 2011. What a lot of people don't realize is AFLAC, three quarters of our business is in Japan. Only 25% of it is here in the US. One in four households has AFLAC policies in Japan. Huge customer base for us. We realized we had to do something immediately. We organized a fundraiser. We gave people a reprise on paying their premiums for six months. We knew how disruptive their lives were going to be because of the tsunami and the, subject, uh, the, the subsequent ac uh, actions with the reactors. We made it a point of, of just saying, okay, we get it. We'll hold off on, on pushing to get the premium collection. Focus on what you need to do. And we'll come back uh, when things get a little more settled. Not a lot of companies would do that. But this was helping them in their time of need. And it made a di the difference because in 2011, even though the Japan market has been a declining market because the population declined, we're still growing. We grow there every year. Our customers remember what we provided during their time of need. Know your stuff. I like to use my CISO, Tim Callahan, as an example of this. Um, when I first got to Aflac, one thing I know is I don't know cybersecurity very well. And I knew that I, the position had been vacant for two years. And we've been looking for years to try and figure out what do we need. But I knew what I needed. I needed someone who had industry expertise outside of insurance. Because honestly, insurance is pretty far behind where a lot of other companies have gone. I needed somebody from the banks. So I targeted banks. And I was lucky and I found Tim work for SunTrust. And he'd done a lot. He was an expert in his field. He knew his stuff. I didn't know his stuff. He knew his stuff. So I made sure I hired a guy that could fill that gap for us as a company. And I made sure I hired a guy that I viewed as my peer. Not at that time, he was a direct report to me. I was hiring him with the full knowledge that he needed to be promoted to that next level because we needed to be taking cybersecurity more, more seriously. And Tim has done a fantastic job with all that he's brought in, the people that he's brought in. He's done a great job growing the program, so much so that we had two of the initiatives that he, his team led that resulted in us in winning a CSO, um, Chief Security Officer 50 awards in 2016 for some of the advanced work that he's doing. When we started this process, we were well below our peers, who by the way, were well below everybody else <laughs> in other industries. 
well below our peers in our evaluation about where we fell on the spectrum of our cybersecurity program. Tim has now, in just a short two years, turned it around so that we are well above our peers and are continuing to invest in this program. And he was promoted to be a senior vice president for the company and is now my peer, just as I intended. Again, I didn't focus on myself and my empire. I focused on what was best for the company and it was getting a guy like him in who I never would have gotten if I couldn't guarantee him an opportunity to move up and, and look out for his career, which I did. So treat everyone with care and respect. And this is a picture of our three founders. Um, and they, they started the company over 60 years ago. And one of the things that they did that they thought they knew was important is you take care of your employees and they'll take care of the customers. As we started, a, they started a program called the Employee Appreciation Week. And I gotta tell you, I have never seen anything like that at any company I have ever worked for. This is an entire week dedicated to our employees in terms of contests and prizes and recognition and a lot of people call it EAW instead of Employee Appreciation Week, it's eat all you want because we feed a lot of people. <laughs> and we definitely gain weight that week. Um, there's a lot of free food that goes out there, but we, it's a lot of fun. It happened to fall on uh, May, the first week of May is typically when we do it. And one of the most fun that I had was um, May the 4th. All right, guess what the theme was? Star Wars. Star Wars, yep. <laughs> and I got to play Princess Leia. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> the younger one, not the older one. <laughs> Even though I'm the older one's age now. But it was fun to, to play that role. And, and all of my team dressed up. I even have my chief of staff dressed up as Chewbacca. <laughs> and he did a great, great impression. So we all, as a leadership team, got engaged in the process, had a contest, wore the costumes proudly. You know, it's, I know it's kind of a nerdy thing to do, but we are IT, so we do like doing that stuff. Um, and we had a blast. It was a lot of fun. A lot of great opportunities to, to meet with all the employees and tell them how much we appreciate all their hard work. And it's every day. It's not just one day of the week. It's the entire time. And I, think that, you know, I still think that's not enough. I, we try and do a lot throughout the year, but that's one particular example of, of um, how I think that's worked very well for Aflac. Your problem is my problem. Now, one of the examples I like to use is we had a project to put in a new IVR in our, in our call center. And that's the interactive voice response system you know, that we all hate when you call the number, especially when I know I have to call the cable company and report an outage. Uh, trying to get through to speak to someone is, a, is an interesting challenge. But in this case, um, this actually helps us out a lot with dealing with some very basic questions. We had a project manager that, that was working with our uh, head of the call, of the call center, the vice president in charge of the call center, and he said, I don't want the Muzak. I don't want to put that on there. I don't want silence. I want something more interesting, something that you know sounds like we're, we're working on your problem, we're solving your problem, we're going to get back to you as soon as possible. So the project manager could have said, all right, I'm going to just hand this off to someone else. You go out and find some sound clips and put something together and we'll throw it out there, uh, see what happens. But the project manager actually had a passion for music, which a lot of IT people do. And so he liked making his own music and he had all the, the gear and the setup to do that. And he found a sound that matched the cadence of what the vice president of uh, customer um, service was looking for. And he created his own clip. And that's now the clip that's being used on the IVR. He took it on himself to say, okay, I'm going to solve this problem. I'm not going to pass the buck and go with some substandard thing. I'm going to take this seriously and come up with something creative that's really going to help out my customer. And I told you, I said, I talk about bad news doesn't get better with age. Uh, the shoot straight is a great opportunity for us to make sure we share our information. Because I, I got to tell you, some of my experiences of... Um, IT typically doesn't like to report bad news. <laughs> we typically think we can solve every problem there is. And we will go out there and work our hardest to do the impossible because we don't like to fail. That's just in our DNA. But sometimes you can't solve the problem. And sometimes you have to know when to let go. Sometimes it can't be fixed. It can't be solved. 
And one of the things that Aflac did, one of the things that impressed me about their approach to shoot straight, is when that tsunami hit, our chief spokesman, the guy who says Aflac, was Gilbert Gottfried, comedian. Unfortunately, he thought it was, it was highly appropriate for him to tweet out some very, very hurtful things about the Japanese. He was fired immediately. There's no fixing that. That was inappropriate. It was not the proper thing to do during to, to this, this poor community who's suffering. And we couldn't stand by it. We couldn't accept it. We couldn't fix it. We just terminated it. We shot straight. And then we went out there and we auditioned over 1,200 people on the internet and found a replacement for him who's been with us to this day and doing a fantastic job on, on our ducks. I don't think we gave out any of the squeaky ducks, but the Aflac that you hear on our commercials today is him. And there is no reference to Gilbert Gottfried anymore. <laughs> so the next one will cover your customer, not your butt. <laughs> J.D. Power has a very extensive process for evaluating customer service centers. You have to be in the top 20% of your benchmark. And the first year we put our IVR out, you know, as I said, IT folks, we don't like to fail. We do it perfect. We try and get everything a customer asks us for, even when sometimes you don't need to do it. We over-engineered our IVR. And we made it so complex, it was one of those IVRs that we all hate to call into because it took you probably 20 steps to get to actually where you wanted to, to do something. And for the life of us, we couldn't figure out how can we kept not getting JD Powers? Every year we put up for it, we wouldn't get it. And it's because we overcomplicated the process. We made it too hard for them to work with us on the IVR. It was easy once they got through to us. We blew away our metrics. We were doing claims in four days, processing a claims payment in four days. That was well above the industry average, I think was closer to nine. Well above our competition. So we were servicing our customers <laughs> once they got through to us, but we were making it very difficult because we had over-engineered this wonderful program and we did everything our, customer, our, our business people asked us for, but it wasn't what our end customers wanted. They just wanted to get quickly to whatever they needed. Well, when we rejiggered the IVR, our customer SAT scores shot up. They were already high, but they, they went astronomically through the roof, over 88%. That's, that's impossible in most IVR and most call centers to be that high. So we finally got the recognition by fixing something that was so simple as an overcomplicated IVR. So I want to talk about an experience that kind of leads to all these examples, takes all these values and puts them together in one initiative that I had the privilege to work on recently. And I, sh I am sure some of you have seen our commercial for One Day Pay. And you've heard us talk about it. Remember I just told you we were paying in four days a claims process. Well, Dan Amos was watching those commercials about auto and getting your auto uh, insurance online. And he saw them teasing each other about, I can do it in 15 minutes, I can do it in seven minutes. You know, making, and he thought, well, we've been advertising four days. Somebody's gonna do it better and faster than us. And I don't wanna be in that situation where we're having to compete from an advertising perspective. I wanna do this in one day. I want to get it down to one day pay. Now, it's not same day because our technology is mainframe. Our technology runs in batch processes overnight. It's not real time. All our rules, all those rules that we have for how we process claims, they don't happen at the point of input. This is one of the challenges we're facing in IT. So the best we could do, the best we were going to be capable of was this, this one day pay capability. So we had our initial meeting, and Dan comes up with the idea, he pulls all the business leaders together, he pulls all the technology leaders together, and says, what's it going to take? Well, I'm going to shoot straight, I'm going to tell them what it's going to take, based on what I know of my environment today. It's going to take me 18 months. I have over 60 different systems that have to be touched. So 60 different systems with all these different people, all this testing, all this integration, it's going to take me 18 months. We 
get off the phone call and I, I knew he wasn't happy. And Dan is a pretty straightforward guy. He talk about shoot straight. He definitely shoots straight. And my phone rings. And I pick it up and it's Dan. And Dan says, let's go to lunch. So I'm in a panic because I know what that means. I'm being taken to the woodshed. I'm about to get chewed out for telling him 18 months. That's unacceptable in his mind. He's going to ask me to perform a miracle and I don't know how we're going to do it. So as I'm flying down Macon Road headed to the Longhorn, <laughs> I realize I've got to get you know, an answer and I'm calling up all the people and saying, you've got to give me some ideas. How can we compress this? What can we do differently? And the, the, the project manager in charge of this said the simplest thing. He says, eliminate the noise. We have 18 number one priorities for claims. We can only have one number one priority. He shot straight with me. He definitely communicated with me. Okay, eliminate the noise. I'm gonna bring that up. So I went to Dan and I said, Dan, you want this compressed? I have got to shut down all this other stuff that we're working on. I need you to isolate this team working on nothing but this project and I need all those business people in the room with us. We gotta work together. I had to make sure he understood what the reality was. And he said, done. He told me, whatever you need, do it. And the team got together, and in less than six months, they delivered this initiative. In several different phases, smaller increments, they didn't do the big bang. You'd be surprised, one of the things we had to do first is, believe it or not, we didn't pay electronically. We had no ACH set up. There was no direct deposit, because our agents love to get a paper check and walk up to the customer and say, here's your claim with a paper check. Can you imagine that? But then they promptly took a picture and got uploaded in their bank account. But <laughs> we were doing that. That was a game changer for us to introduce technology that you would think everybody has, but we didn't. And that was what our biggest drawback was, how are we gonna make that date? And we did, and we launched it. And we've met that mark in a day, and in some cases actually less, because in some cases we, we run a job where our bank, we can process it that actual day. Now, of course, the bank takes a day to get it loaded, but you know, that's, that's their rules. But the thing that we discovered in all of this, the thing that's important to us is Aflac's core tenant is we are there for our customers in their time of need. We sell supplemental insurance. We sell the insurance that if somebody gets a serious illness and cannot work, we're gonna pay their wages to help them pay their bills. They can't wait four days. They're living paycheck to paycheck. So one day is incredibly important. And we want to pay claims. I was in a meeting recently with my fellow carriers, CIOs, and I asked them, what are you guys doing about this new initiative that's just been announced with the banks where they're saying that ACH has to be paid the same day? What are you guys going to do about claims? And not one of them had any intention of ever, just because they could do it, they would never do it because they want what's called float. They want that interest on hanging on to that claim as long as possible. Not helping people in their time of need. And I learned this the hard way when my father passed away earlier this year. I've been helping my mother process his, his um, life uh, insurance payments. And it's amazing to me that the things that people come up with, the rules that they come up with, the nuances for why they reject the claim over and over and over again, because they know the statistics. They know my mother's more likely to die within a year of her spouse at her age. And if they can stall that payment as long as possible, they will. That's why none of these companies are on Ethosphere. But that's why Aflac is. It's important to us. We value it. It's a core tenet of why we're here. And it's a core tenet of what we do. And it's what makes me proud to be an employee of Aflac. And I don't regret for a moment my decision. And I left Atlanta and a lot of friends to come here. But I'm loving Columbus. And I love all of you guys that have come to work for us and come through our program. And I'm thrilled to be here. And I'm thrilled to be with Aflac. So thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And I wanted to leave it open for any questions that you guys might have about my journey. And uh, 
ethical leadership. <laughs> and you get prizes, right? Matt, you have some things? Or did you give them all away? <laughs> there were a few prizes left. Okay. <laughs> I see some of you have your ducks. <laughs> no, I won't take it away, but if you ask me a question, I'll give you another one. <laughs> yes? Um, how many years did you do in the Air Force, and um, what rank did you get out of it? Uh, I did five years. Yeah. So I owed four for my bachelor's degree, and then I started working on my master's while I was in the Air Force, so I owed another year after that. So five years was what I owed, and I was captain when I left. Yes? I'm sorry? Am I what? How you hard is some leadership program? The, the leadership. The servant servant leadership. leadership. Oh, the servant leadership program. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of this in that, and, and you know, that's part of the process is realizing that my role as a leader is to help people fulfill the best of their capabilities, is to get in when I need to, be there to help them when I need to, but not micromanage. I mean, you've got to let people try things on their own, and sometimes they make mistakes, give them guidance and help them, uh, help them get better at, it, at their job and what they do. But you also have to know when to stand back because people don't learn by micromanagement. They don't. If anything, it's going to put them off. Is it? Yes? Does AFLAC sell policies to companies for um, um, losses arising from a data breach? No. We, the question is, do we sell policies related to cybersecurity breaches? Yes. And we're not in the general liability space. We focus more on the employee. Uh, so we will sell to companies, but we sell to the employee individual policies. Now we do offer uh, a capability, one actually one of the products that we do offer as part of that, it's free product actually, and that's protection for the individual, not to the company. So how does AFLAC then self, do, they, do you all self-insure against a data breach for AFLAC? The data breach self-insurance, um, actually we do. We do have an insurance policy. But one of the things that we've assessed is that any loss of data that we may have, assuming there's a certain fine associated with that, we've extrapolated what that cost will be, and we've put a policy together uh, as to what that would cover from a financial loss. It's not financial. These losses are reputational loss. This is stock market loss. This is what we saw with Target. They didn't lose it because they got fined. They lost all this money because their stock price tumbled. That's something you cannot buy insurance for. And that's something that the reason why the communication and make sure frequent communications is important is we have a whole plan if, not if, but probably when we get breached for how we communicate. It's all about the communication to the street, to the press, and the reaction and response. And we, we put plans together related. That's one of the things Tim has been very instrumental, is it's not just about the event happening, it's about how you respond to the event. And we practice twice a year. Believe me, it's, uh, you get on phone calls at 8 o'clock at night with Japan uh, talking about breaches. And uh, some interesting scenarios come up in how you communicate that and deal with the press. Yes? Um, OK, so I work for a company that has the same or similar core values as you all do, especially for it to be retail. Um, and like, I guess we're a new store, and so it's hard to kind of follow, well, it's hard for everyone to follow those values. How do you all, when you open new locations, make sure that those employees are following your core values? Th that's a great question, is how do you make sure other locations are following the core values? And that's true of any company, especially if you acquire a company, they have a different set of values that they've been operating from. And when you create a new location, one of the things that Aflac had to do recently is we brought all of our sales leadership, which had previously been 1099s, meaning they were agents, they, they weren't employees of Aflac, we brought them in. That was 66 market offices that we previously had no involvement with. They went through extensive training they even went through an evaluation process. Some of the, the people that had been market directors that were, they were not employed by AFLAC, they didn't pass our hiring criteria. We actually get tested on this. Do we have the moral values that AFLAC supports? And if people didn't pass our tests, they don't get hired. And it's an ongoing training process. I still go through training every year on this. We have to train on it and make sure we're current. And we, we apply situations. And when we do find situations with an acquisition that didn't follow our rules, we deal with it quickly. We respond quickly. And, and we address it. 
because we have very low tolerance for people that violate this. If we have employee, employer um, managers being abusive to their employees, they're going to be terminated. That's not tolerated. Just like if employees are abusive to other employees, not tolerated. That's not part of our, our, our beliefs. And I've seen um, AFLAC act quickly when you're dealing with, with people that do violate any one of these tenants. Great question. Yes. How are you all making the shift from being a company that's focused on customers to really a, a kind of like a technology type company? That's a great question. How do you focus on shifting from being very customer focused and person focused to technology? Well. We've had a major investment since I've gotten there in new technology. We are pumping money into IT like crazy, which is one of the reasons why we're hiring like crazy, is we're trying to modernize our technology. I'm dealing with 30-year-old systems that were, the system is called Life70 because it was put in in the 70s. <laughs> so we have to get rid of that. I can't, I gotta do, I wanna do same day pay. We actually wanna do same day pay. That means we gotta have input uh, validation at the point of data entry. And we've got to be able to allow that data input to come from the customer directly, not having to go through a third party or through a, a person uh, on, on the phone. So that's a game changer for us, and that's one of the things that we're investing heavily in is to provide that level of a customer experience similar to what Amazon provides. That's what people are used to. Yeah, that's and that's a mobile app or anything. Mobile and, and online, it's both. I mean, we, we're working on a mobile app actually for our claims experience. So that you can, you can be in the doctor's office, photocopy you know, your invoice, and process it right there and get paid before you even leave the office. That's our goal. Yeah. It's great. Yes? So you said that um, before, four day pay and whatever you had before that was based out of a mainframe. How much just, how hectic that must that be just to find people who know the mainframe and <laughs> work with it just so you could overhaul it so you could do this one day pay? Well, it, it, it was very difficult. I mean, that was the reason why we had to say shut all the other projects down related to the mainframe. I needed every available resource working on this problem. And they're not out there. There are not a lot of them. I mean, we, we supplemented, you, you know, I've had to hire people from all over the world that happen to have the experience. And one of the places we found people actually was in Israel. Um, had a lot of mainframe skills. So we had to go global to be able to support our need. To, to get this done in a, in a relatively quick time frame. Because it's not a skill you guys are learning and I wouldn't expect you to. Yes, ma'am. You are? Yes. Wow. Like that. <laughs> that's, that's impressive. Um, but it is, believe it or not, it's not going away. People think it is, but honestly, you talk to our actuarials and let's just say we replace the system. We have stuff on there we're never going to convert. And according to the actuarial, it's going to take 20 years to run off. So I got to run the mainframe for another 20 years, at least. <laughs> Great question. You guys have any other? I think we got a few more minutes, if not. One day pay, could you go into a little bit more detail about what kinds of white noise you have eliminated? Uh, the white noise? Yeah. Well, the noise being all the other projects, oh, okay. the, the, that was the problem. Is we had a lot of things going on, so we had change this field and change this product and add this kind of capability, and and um, so we that was what a lot of things that we were working on. Put more stuff in the IVR. <laughs> um, yes. So did you just put those on the back burner, or they we put them on the back burner, and some of them went away. Okay. Um, and frankly, the one that went away was the IVR, put more stuff on the IVR is when we realized <laughs> it really doesn't need any more stuff and it needs to be simplified. <laughs> so uh, that one actually was one of the examples of things. That, but oddly enough, you know, once people realized we had a number one focus and a priority and that was our mission, all the other stuff didn't matter. And all of a sudden it stopped becoming important. And it was a game changer for us to focus. Because working on 20 things at once is a lot of waste of energy. Working on one thing, getting it done, and then moving on to the next, huge, huge difference. Great. All right, well, thank you all. I think a student needs a passion for what they're doing for their job and, and focus on really what can they do for their customers, what can they do for their company, and less on what they're doing for their careers. The career will come, the, the learnings will come, and if they're more open to being uh, the best that they can and learning all that they can, they'll be very successful in their careers.